The condition is really crazy condition. I mean, I shouldn't give away the whole secret to professional winter. Mateo Yakino giving up one elbow around for his body. Here we go. What a finish. The guy is kind of talking bullshit. The team has just got to work a little harder. Welcome to the Windsurfing Podcast, back again for episode seven. And this week, we have arguably the best all-round windsurfer in the world today. Yeah, it's a big call. But when you have dominated the freestyle scene, um, you've won many a world title and podiums in the slalom. And just last year, won the Wave World title. I don't think anyone else can take that crown. Um, you're obviously not wondering who it is. It is, of course, Sarah Keita off Ringer, uh, the undisputed queen of women's windsurfing. Uh, and Matchet catches up with her to talk about, well, equality in the sport. We talk about life on tour and those earlier days with her parents. We talk about wave world titles or world titles and which one means the most. A real interesting chat. Uh, uh, with Sarah Keita, the ever smiling and ever loud, a Reuben princess. Sarah Keita, thank you for coming on our little show. Um, I think I should start by greeting you the same exact way you always greet me. How is that? Rutko, what's up? I mean, Sarah, what's up? How are you doing? How's life? Ah. I mean, Where's the excitement, man? I'm louder than that. Yeah, you're way louder. But it's actually <laughs> genuine. I think nobody ever, like... <laughs> I can hear you, like, from the other side of, like, the contest area, but... <laughs> Anybody else would be annoying, you know, but somehow with you, it's just, <laughs> it's just good vibes. Is it like always 100% genuine? You're always like so much full of energy. How, how does this work? <laughs> I mean, yeah, if I'm yelling, like, yeah, if I'm yelling, then it's, then it's like 110% energy. And if I'm not, then you don't hear me and you don't see me either, but... Usually when I'm yelling, it's like... Uh, How genuine. do you do it? Like, what's the trick? I want to have so much positivity. Positivity. Is it like start with... 15 hours of sleep a day or... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Probably three espressos before 10 a.m. And then if you catch me at like at my caffeine high, man, then the pitch of my voice, voice goes really, really high. And um, I think I'm just happy to see people on tour, you know? Like, the people on tour are some of my favorite people in the world and... So I'm just excited to meet people and uh, share the windsurfing stoke on the water and on the beach. Yeah, on the water, you're, you, can, you can also be sometimes, <laughs> like even like, I don't know, somebody would do a Vulcan and you would like go nuts. <laughs> stoke for that person. I remember when I landed my first Vulcan, like I lost my mind. So I'm just as excited for that person as well. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just think it's a certain happiness for windsurfing and um, all, the, all the windsurfing people around me also are very positive people. So, yeah. Or you see it that way. <laughs> That's good. Anyway, I know one thing you hated. I read it. I couldn't believe. Tell me. You hated windsurfing at first. Is that true? Oh, so I didn't hate it, but I wasn't good at it straight away. So then if I can't do something, I don't like it so much. Um, the thing is I was nine and the sail was pretty heavy so I couldn't lift it up on my first try and my brother was 12 and he lifted the sail in his first try and he did a tack on his first try, jived straight. So he was just going back and forth and I couldn't even lift the thing so I just... So you were competitive, stopped. straight away competitive. I guess so. I, uh, yeah, I was doing a lot of other sports at the time already so like I did a lot of swimming, tennis, gymnastics. And I couldn't lift the seals. So you were like after. Aruba champion in swimming or something, no? You were, I saw um, one clip like, like it was proper. It was not like just going to the pool. Or, 
by it. Yeah, it was proper training. Yeah, it was like in the the Aruban selection and stuff. And stuff for Aruban standards, I was I was good. I had a couple of records on like short like on the short distances, um, freestyle freestyle fifty meters and hundred meters and backstroke. Um, but that lasted until I was like sixteen or something. That's when I was swimming quite seriously. Um, and then windsurfing slowly took over. But um, I think as a kid, I've stuck to like playing tennis, swimming, and windsurfing the most. Mm-hmm. So I've done that quite a bit. And How's the scene in Aruba? Because, you know, we know that there always used to be World Cups and this Aruba high winds, and everybody thinks that, you know, Caribbean, beautiful water, etc. Yeah. But how, how is it? How many people windsurf and what's, what's the general situation there? Yeah, I think just comparing it to, let's say, 20 years ago, it, it, it's quite a difference. Um, it's not the biggest sport on the island. It's very known because I'm a, I'm a known person on the island, so everyone knows about windsurfing. But it's not very accessible to a lot of people. So I think that is one problem for the locals. They, um, yeah, it's kind of expensive, you know. But condition-wise, it's one of the best places in the world because it's so consistent all year long, like from December till August you you're gonna get so many days on the water um there's just um there's a lot of kids now they do mostly slalom and um every time i go on tour like the older riders are like ah aruba they used to go there in the 90s and um they had world cups and everything here bjorn dunkerbeck antoine all those guys have been here um the last one was about 10 years like in 2011 because I was, yeah. I was just starting to do the tour and I didn't go because obviously I didn't have money. But um, but anyway, you mentioned like everybody knows you. I heard you almost mm-hmm. cannot get out of the house, like full celebrity status. No, that's not true. It's still an island, you know. So the thing is, anywhere I go, people will recognize me and they will say hi to me and stuff. But it's, it's like a really nice thing because it's, um, it's very supportive. People, they will come up to me to take pictures and then they're like, ah, when are we going for the next win? Like, they don't ask me, when are you going for the next win? They're like, when are we going? So it's like, they're going to battle with me. Yeah, so I have, like, the island is kind of, yeah, I have the support from the island. It's it's really nice. But not like that I cannot get out of the house. It's it's actually a very nice thing. Yeah, Um, but if you want to, I don't know, get drunk one night or go out meet some people and you don't want it to be public or whatever like yeah you know, totally it, fine it's an, it's an island it's really not that bad it's a, not a paparazzi celebrities things that we see on television not at all okay. yeah it's you're easy. always always modest that's not what i heard from <laughs> from I know the what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah <laughs> But whatever. You be talking to. Depends where I go and what we do. <laughs> yeah. How how does a girl from this little island in the Caribbean, on the outskirts of the Caribbean, let's say, yeah, become a professional windsurfer? Like mm-hmm. it's not something I don't even I, I can't even name like another pro windsurfer from Aruba from back in the day that you could say like, you know, that kind of drags you on. Is it the Bonarian thing or how does it, because everybody needs somebody to, you know, some kind of impulse to, to bring them to, to, you know. So I think um, because we were neighboring islands with Bonaire, um, we had a couple of guys here in Aruba that were actually really good windsurfers, uh, racers and freestylers. The, the, one of the most known riders like before me is um, Jeroen Westrate. He actually did really well and he, he has, has been on tour in waves. Um, still, anytime I go to Hawaii, they always ask me about Jeroen. Um, but what, when I started, I was looking up to like my brother, this local guy, Wim Aylens and uh, Javier Santiago. And they had quite a good level, but there, was the, there were the Bonaires that were like one step ahead, you know. Um, and at the time, I was traveling to Bonaire quite a bit, like two, three times a year. So then with the local guys here and seeing the guys in Bonaire, um, that's where I got my motivation from. 
most of the time. And um, the guys from Bonaire, like they were top notch, you know, they were inventing all the freestyle moves. So I had the best in the world next door. Um, so I think those were the guys I looked up to most starting windsurfing. I still do. Um, and not just because, not just because of their windsurfing abilities, but just for how much they, they love the sport itself and um, how much they love being on the water. So like all the excitedness that you're talking about me, that's, I think it's a general thing here in the Caribbean. Yeah, but then you need to somehow get sponsors, book the tickets, go yeah. try and like, how does that whole situation and you were super young when you did your first international yeah. event you were 14 i guess so like i said so training wise i had all of these guys around me so that was pushing my level i actually barely went with girls you know so only saw guys and that was my standard um then i had of course i had very supportive parents like i got my first set when i was 10 i guess a four seven sale and 85 liter board so i kept on training on that and what I, where I got lucky, I guess, is that the PWA came to Bonaire in uh, 2001, I think. So I entered the, am entered the amateur event and saw the professional sailing. And the year after, uh, PWA came back and I actually entered the professionals. Um, and I was 12. They didn't want to, wanted me to join because I was too young. But I, I finished fifth, which was pretty good. And I think because I was at that and that event that happened to be in Bonaire, I met with, um, yeah, with more professionals. In the end, I had Sven Rasmussen from, from Starboard that bought me a ticket to the Canary Islands the, the year after. Um, yeah, and from then on, as soon as you step into the international scene, you kind of get into the spotlight and it kept on rolling from there, I would say. So I'm, I guess everything started rolling the moment PWA came here next door that's so what that's i always right. tell parents and kids that no matter how unprepared you feel you are like if you can get a wild card into the event go you know like go even if you're gonna get last like i felt i did it way too late because once you're actually on tour that's when you start actually properly learning right and being around the guys and yeah being with the best in the world is the the best way to get better you know so you can wait if you want, but like you said, if you can, I would also join. Yeah. So before going to Fuerte your first time, did you know, did you expect something? Did you know you were good? Did you, you know, you so progressed so fast at that young age that, uh, you know, you could. Yeah, I guess what also helped me is that Starboard, they were producing this Pro Kids line. So I actually had, at when I was 13, because I was sailing with big gear before, like big people gear. And then I got this Pro Kids board. And on that, I actually learned a lot. So that helped. The first uh, event I did in the Canaries was in Lanzarote, actually. Which I, yeah, I wasn't expecting much. Because like I said, I'm only sailing, I was only sailing with guys. And then I got to the event. And I, I was doing switch dance moves, which was normal for me. But none of the girls were doing it. Um, or barely. So I finished third there. And um, I think it still didn't sink in. But when I finished it, I was like, oh, okay, I, I can do this. <laughs> and, um, it isn't until like a couple of years after that I started realizing like, wow, that was pretty good. Um, yeah. I think, I think the very next year you actually won in Fuerte, right? Like at 15 years old. Like, yeah, 2006. I won the... Uh, actually, I did really bad in Pozo, the, the event before. So I actually had zero expectations. And then I went to Fuerteventura, and I guess because I didn't have any pressure, didn't think of it, I, yeah, I just had fun, and I won the event. Also, didn't realize until, like, the last, last moment that I was actually winning it. Like, when they announced it, I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> great. Yeah. And how does that feel at a, you know, at such a young age? You go up against people... You know, the Moreno twins, Karen Yagi was competing still, and all these kind of people that you probably saw in magazines or I don't know, like you didn't. How, how does that, does it feel surreal or did you expect because you were already last year doing it? And yeah. 
Yeah, I, I'm wondering, and does it change much in your mind? Like, okay, I can do it now, I'll, I'll do it again. Yeah, I, so I didn't have much input from professionals when I was, when I started. It was like no magazines, there wasn't so much, there weren't so many online platforms. Only when I saw them in Bonaire the first time is like the first time I realized there were professionals out there and that, that they were good at what they did. So that's when I saw the Morenos, um, Karen Yagi for the first time and I saw their tricks and that actually pushed me to, for the year after, to keep training hard. I said like, you know, I want to do that too. Um, and then at the same time, when I went to those events in the Canaries, it was, you know, you're a kid. So actually, I don't, I just remember wanting to, to beat them also because I think to get to the top, like to have that motivation, you have something to work towards. And in my mind, I didn't see the age difference or anything. I was just looking at the tricks that they were performing on the water. It's like, you know, I am going to do that too. And yeah, so I started doing that in the heats. I just think that um, back then when I won, it was, it was cool, but I don't think I thought so much about it. Because... I'm not saying it came easy, but it came quickly. Um, and now, for example, like I moved into slalom and ways, and that took me a bit longer to, to get to that point. So like, I feel like now I maybe appreciate it a bit more, even though I had put the effort and the work into it at the time also as a kid. I just didn't think of it as... Yeah, you don't training. analyze. I think you don't analyze. I talked to Rosinho before, and he told yeah. me the same, that you know he won a contest at 16 on the indoor, and... He just, I don't know, he just went and did it. And many times if like we grow up and we lose that ability to, to go out and, and just do it, which is, which is insane yeah. as a kid. I think you don't, yeah, you don't think about it. You don't analyze it at all, right? Same with learning new tricks. You must mm -hmm. have progressed insanely fast at that, at that time. <laughs> Maybe. I, yeah, you did. We saw, we all saw it on, on magazines and on pictures and yeah. on videos and all that. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, I think just my main, main point is that like back then it happened and I was happy about it. But like these days I'm, I'm way more, I'm way more appreciative of, of winning an event or doing well and stuff. Cause I just realizing the work and effort that has gone into it. Yeah, it doesn't seem so easy anymore, right? Like it did back then, I guess. Not easy, but yeah. like you say, you analyze and stuff. Anyway, the yeah. following year, I think I think we met. I met you at sixteen. Um, we're the same age, and you remember in silt? the very first time I met you in Silt. You remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember that. <laughs> you, I was I was just sitting in the sailor's lounge in the evening having a beer as you do at 16 yeah, i wasn't and you just walk straight up to me you just like from the entrance you walk straight up to me and what did you say you remember no ah wait something about not having a beer i think yeah like uh how old are you yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like 16. All right. So why are you having a beer? Oh, man. Like this. Like my 16-year-old mother. I was one year I older. Had similar hair, too. Yeah, yeah. I remember talking about the Afros because I think people were, like, connecting us a bit like that. Because actually, your, your hair is bigger than mine and blonder. Nah, it's not bigger. Definitely not. Not when you had it. When you had it really big, it was huge yeah for sure yeah. but i want to kind of segue from this because that's not i just didn't say this to sound cool what i'm getting at is do you feel like being on tour on such a young age being away from home being um kind of in the spotlight and having these two different worlds and switching and this and that do you feel like you lose something, you gain something, but you also lose that kind of normal adolescence period? You know, in Poland, it is having a beer at 16 and, and these kind of things, you know, but um, did, you, did, did you feel like, 
or you didn't feel at that time, but looking back, do you, do you see that a little bit? Yeah, so, so I had my parents on tour with me for a long time. So they kind of kept me in check also. So not that I'm like gonna go off the, the track, you know, but um, I think it was a very important for me, for, for them, for me to have them with me all the time um, until I was about 18. So I actually, where I feel that you kind of get mature quickly because you're around older people all the time. Um, and I think actually that's a really good thing. Um, only thing that sometimes I felt like I felt like I was missing out on certain stuff at home because I was traveling all the time, you know, cause I saw my friends were going to parties and I was missing out on a couple of things, which at the time I didn't like so much. But if I think about it now, like who has these experiences of traveling so much, you know, and I think that traveling has, as for you, I think it just matures you a bit quicker. Um, yeah, then yeah. you come back, like at certain point, I felt like I was going, coming back from a windsurf trip with my older friends and then going back to school and I was feeling old, like, like these guys yeah. are, are like, I have no, no connection to what, you know what I mean? Like, yes. we're already thinking about traveling, booking tickets and this and that, and they're talking about video games or whatever, you know, like... It's, so it's just different. Once I but, started, uh, go ahead, sorry. But you, you, you experienced it way more for sure because you were away a long time and it's like every time you travel, it's the other side of the world and, you, mm -hmm. you know, so, so I was just wondering. I, so I don't think I traveled that much because I lived here in Aruba. First of all, I got to windsurf most of the time here. I didn't have to escape the winter and stuff. So I would only leave for a photo shoot in April. I'd be gone in the, all summer. That's, I would be gone all summer. And then I would be gone in September somewhere for, um, for still. So I would, I would be gone three, three times a year. Um, I, do, I do think that on tour, like Kiri was on tour, Goyito, like we were all a bit the same age also. So I didn't, I wasn't, so I was, it was a good time, you know? It wasn't just me with all the older people. Like I was sailing with them most of the time anyway. But I feel like I was living in two worlds. Like this only really started once I moved to Holland to study. Um, and that's where I felt it a lot. And I, I don't know why, but um, it's like you were saying, you get there to school and people are only thinking about like um, the next party or, you know, only looking forward to, to the next like fun night out when I was thinking about booking tickets and what trip to do and just yeah. looking a bit further, you know, like I was actually studying to make sure I finish everything so I could fly out, you know, and. Um, yeah, but now, now looking back, I really appreciate having these two worlds because then you, you really switch off, you know, now I wish sometimes you're like, you go from an event to a test trip, photo shoot, promotional event, whatever, and you don't get that time where not everybody treats you. I mean, I already feel sometimes I don't want to be treated as just through this window yeah. of being a windsurfer. And then yeah. you must get it a hundred times more, you know, because you're a million times world champion and so recognizable, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et you know, so, so I guess this is what, what I was trying to get at, you know, and try to yeah. <laughs> squeeze out of you <laughs> whether sometimes it feels, you know, a little bit i i just feel like every time i'm home like people treat me normal like on the on the street yeah people say hi to me and congratulate me and stuff but like with my family it's it's all very normal with all my friends also um but like it's just the, like the tour thing i just feel like you know when i'm on tour sometimes i feel like i'm missing out on stuff at home and family but then when i'm home and with family i'm like ready to leave and and <laughs> go on and experience things again you know so that's the two world thing that i struggle with sometimes but um yeah you just gotta like enjoy both yeah so sick of traveling so sick of traveling then you go home for five days and you're like ready to go especially when you go back to cold you know yeah. we probably experienced that in holland like you go back to the cold like five days you're like you're at like I start looking at forecast tickets, 
whatever, you know, just to at least feel like I tried. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, like, so you get on tour like 14, 15, 16, and back then the freestyle scene, it wasn't what it is now. All these guys that are on tour now, they were on tour then, but they were probably like 16, 18, 20 year olds. Uh, I don't know, mm -hmm. Anthony, Ricardo, Mavis, and all these. Goito is a bit maybe younger, but all this yeah. group. And it was a pretty, I think I did. Um, I asked Thomas Traversa about it. He was there as well, you know. And he, he mentioned some wild, wild times. How was it for you to, to come see that, you know, it's like a, it's basically a group of friends, mm -hmm. you know, maybe competing, but, you know, out there having fun and experiencing and learning. Did you get to, did you get to actually hang out or was it like your parents put you in a bubble and kind of? Yeah. So, yeah, I think my parents, my mom, especially they was, were quite protective of me. Cause first of all, as a girl, I was like 14, 15 getting on tour. Um, so actually, it was like windsurfing and going back home. We actually spent a lot of time with the Bonarian crew. Like we would hang out a lot, you know, and then if, we, if we'd be at places, like I wouldn't go, like now we go to Pozo like six weeks in advance train and have like a certain lifestyle there and then compete. But we would, back then, we would just arrive two, three days before, compete and then leave again. So I think it was just, it was pretty, not strict, but it was like pretty straightforward. Um, it wasn't until after once I started traveling with my brother and then later by myself that um, I really, it really became a family, you know, everyone on tour and you kind of um, look out for each other. And I loved it as a kid with my parents, but I think I love it even more. Like every year I love it more being on tour. Like you said, you're, you're there with a big group. Actually, you're all friends, even though you're competing against each other. And um, yeah, I started experiencing that after like I was 18, 19. And yeah, I really, really enjoy it. It's a, there's some experiences in there like that you cannot explain to people, you know, and um, no, yeah. not at all. And you should and some some that you shouldn't really mention too. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. But the, <laughs> those events, like in Asia, for example, like yeah. Yeah, it's pretty surreal. Pretty yeah. surreal, like uh, going to Jinha Beach for sure. Somewhere you wouldn't go to necessarily, but if it if it wasn't for the events. Uh, yeah good times there so then you kind of win your first event then you win your first title and then you go on like an absolute rampage i guess for 12 years you just i think you lost one one heat right in 12 years 12 Last straight year. titles um and just yeah um my question is, does it, where do you take the motivation from? Mm -hmm. Do you need a new challenge? Do you, how, how does it come about? Do you just go to the event just because it's in your contract? Do you actually enjoy it? You know, like. I mean, yeah. So in the beginning, it's like you're working towards something. There's, there's this level and you want to get to that level. So that's the motivation at first. Then I got the title. I was like, okay, I'm going to keep the title, keep training. Didn't really think about it. So then I won it two, three, four times. Um, so it's like, okay, this is going well. And that's when I started to think like, you know what? I'm going to try the different disciplines. So that's when I moved into slalom sailing as well. Um, which at first I was making a lot of mistakes, but I also had like highlights. And then slowly I started to become more consistent. Like from one year to the next, all of a sudden I was consistent. And um, I won that title in 2011, I think. Um, did that a bit like slalom freestyle and then realized, you know, I can do it. So then slowly I started moving into wave sailing. So I was just looking for the next challenge every time because I do need, um, like I like competing and I like the pressure of competing because it makes me perform better. And 
yeah, I just saw that Waves was the next challenge. So sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes for freestyle, like, like now it's like really exciting, you know, like Micah beat me last year and it just like gave me that kick of my butt that I needed to train really hard and keep well, pushing. Let's, let's, for the people that don't know, you won the yeah. single elimination. She came back through the double and you had a final. She beat you and then you had a sale off a super final, which happens when, and then you beat her. So she did it. I mean, she beat you in a heat. She didn't actually yeah, win the contest. But that's all I needed, you know? Like, I didn't need more than that. I remember um, being on the beach that, um, that day because I think you guys were competing before the slalom. No, no, this was in there where she beat me. She didn't beat me. I know, but I know, yeah. Yeah, no, so I must have been watching. I must have been watching. Yeah, in Fuerte, it was really close. And then I, there I must have been watching on, um, on, on the live stream. Yeah. But I remember you being kind of emotional. I don't know, like you were, yeah, was, I don't know, what, what was it? Like, not, not sad, but not, I don't know, what, what was it? Happy for her, but got it for yourself and... No, I was a total wreck that day. I think I was, um, I got so nervous because that's a year that I could have won my 10th title. So that actually got to me a bit, like in my mind, it's like, oh, this is number 10, I can make it happen now. And then at the same time, like, Mike was building a bit of momentum with the crowd also, you know, because I think at that point, I'm not the underdog anymore and people want to see the underdog win or they want to see if someone could beat me. And Micah, Micah could do it, you know, if she, if she sailed at her best and I, yeah. So I was just really nervous before the heat and during the heat, I didn't sail my best. And yeah, I just got, I could hear them shout for her and it just like, it hurts a bit, you know. But in the end, that's comp competition. And um, it's not like against me. It's more like they want to see the best person win or they also want to see, wanted to see if, they, if she could make it happen. So I got back to the beach and I was all emotional about it because I got all nervous and I, I didn't enjoy it. And I, I, just, I just said like, you know, if, if every competition is going to be like this after this, then I don't want to compete anymore. Yeah, um, I didn't, I never seen you in, in a with a face like this I, I couldn't really that's why I couldn't really identify like if you were sad or pissed off or you know just disappointed in yourself or or, or whatever it was you know so no it's just a bit broken I was like oh man this is like I didn't enjoy it so yeah, yeah I just need to deal with myself like if I ever get to that point again that I don't enjoy competing it's not that I didn't want to lose. It's just like I, I was too nervous. I didn't feel a good heat. And I, I'm there to like put down my best performance every time. Yeah. That's what Welcome to the world of like regular competitors and human beings. You know, <laughs> 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 that happens. And it happens, you know, like, I mean, in slalom, I think, I think that happens like, every elimination to half of the guys you know that no that's different because i've had it also in waves and slalom and freeze like i've had bad heats but not because just because i wasn't focused but here i was so nervous you know okay. it's just like i just lost the fun of it but if i have a bad heat it's okay i just get this you'll see me with a different face then like i get this pretty pissed at myself but um it's funny yeah. how you mentioned the, the energy of the crowd kind of going yeah. against you because the same thing happened in Tenerife um, a few years back with, um, with Daira, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny how the perspective changes once you, you kind of get to that, to that level because I cannot really understand. So there was... A heat where I think Steffi, Steffi Val beat her. Yeah. And then you girls, you chaired, you chaired Steffi up the beach, right? Yeah. Daira took it really personally that you yeah. were cheering against her, all of you, you know. And yeah, that's... Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering, like, do you need to win like 20 world titles to feel like that? How, how does that feeling come? 
Yeah, so, I mean, I guess for me, that was the same situation, except for that Steffi actually won. And sh she can take it however she wants, but um, in the end, it's the same with me. In the end, people just want to see, she, like, she was, is unbeatable, like, in Pozo and in Tenerife, she's, like, the best jumper in the world, you know? So, of course, people are going to be excited to see someone else uh, take her down, which is the same case for me in freestyling. So it's not like vote, it's not cheering against uh, that person. It's more cheering for the person that that actually won and made it happen. Because I think also that gives other people like inspiration. Like you know, it is possible to beat that person. So um, I I just thought it was a cool thing for Steffi also, and yeah. Um, I just started feeling like that a couple of titles in i started noticing that i'm not like the underdog and people want to see other people win as well like i don't know how it happens but it just i just remember that year like all of a sudden it switched and i was like oh man this is like a total different experience and and let me tell you like it's it's hard to be at that point it's hard to stay at the top getting there is getting there you have a reason to move forward and upwards but if you're up there like, who else do you look up to, to to go further, you know? So it's it's hard to stay up there. Yeah. And then things like that it's in your contract, that you get money for it, you kind of, you start feeling that it's normal, right? You don't necessarily take that as motivation anymore. You need to find new motivations, I would imagine, every year. I yeah. think... The, the 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 like if you if you see like any of the athlete like the best like Kelly Slater or Michael Jordan or all these guys, they try to always find even if it's not really real, they try to find these little little motivations you know whether they be even sometimes negative like I don't know this guy said something about me I'm gonna destroy him or whatever you know, so yeah. I'm wondering what it is for you because you did win. Um, if I'm correct, 12 freestyle titles in a row now. So yeah. there must be something. <laughs> uh, I, my main goal is just to like raise the bar for women in uh, freestyling. And I like, I have the ability. So uh, that is already a push for me to do better. Like it over the years I've had, not necessarily towards me, but just towards women in general. Like I've heard so many comments from mo from men very often, you know, and that's kind of a big motivation for me to keep doing my best. So it's not necessarily that I need to win, but it's like as a whole, I feel like since since I have that ability to to be where I am in freestyling, it also helps and show that what is possible. It also helps other women to go to get better, you know. Are you so not I tempted? Think, are you not tempted to just enter the man contest and kick some freaking ass? I know you try. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think they're. I don't. Yeah, I think they said it once or twice, but I don't think it's actually a, like as an exhibition event, maybe. But on the PWA, I don't think they're going to do that. Though I don't necessarily need to do that either. Um, I mean, for me, it's already enough to like train with other guys that are really good like sailing with amado for example or seeing Goyito on the water is really really ins inspiring so that's already enough for me but you did beat i heard you beat marco lufen in some exhibition event in somewhere is that yeah, true? i don't remember if i won i think he no he i remember him winning that event in the end um but i don't remember if i actually beat him um, but I remember he was nervous. Yeah, pretty nervous. I mean, this happened when, when Daida, uh, somewhere in the early 2000s, she entered actually a male event in Pozo. Yeah. And I don't think, um, I'm not sure if she passed any heats, but it was yeah. the story of the event pretty much. And I wouldn't want to come up against her. I mean, <laughs> no. Imagine you, like, you break your mast, and or whatever you no, know not, or you go yeah. to the bunker and for the rest of your life you need to hear 
for the rest of the life of your life you have to live at the bunker you can't show your face yeah yeah so um it would be cool to do though you know just for fun like in pose we've had these events where they have um um several like team team heats so i think i've been in a heat with victor fernandez and then a junior also so then they kind of mix the men and women yeah. i think it's actually kind of cool to do i would pay to see you go against um go against men for sure in uh yeah maybe in freestyling in freestyle, yeah. in freestyle of course yeah 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 i mean i yeah uh, we spoke like i think um a few years ago in Forte, we kind of start asking around, I don't know, Arnon, I guess somebody started asking around like the freestylers and they said like, yeah, you would definitely pass a couple heats, you know, if you sail your best, you can definitely. Yeah, there was a one or two years that uh, back then that I actually, I think I could, but then I went to study in Holland. So I feel like I didn't progress so much in those years. Um, and now, I don't know. Would be cool to try. I think it's a good motivation because, like, yeah, I I am very competitive. So if I do happen to yeah. have to see it again, yeah, I let me text life. Rich Page right now. Yes, send him a message. <laughs> <laughs> we mentioned Daira and her competing against men. Yeah. Uh, the twins together happen to be probably the most dominant thing in women's windsurfing we've seen. Um, yeah. And I actually had to like Google it because I had no idea how many titles they won. 28, I think, together. So, you know, so that's yeah, my, yeah, sure. they won 28. Yeah. You won 17 now. Is oh, that... Yeah. Not is bad. that something that's on your mind a little bit? I mean, it sounds like a lot, but if you win the three disciplines for like four years in a row, you're there. And I mean, that's two of them. Daira has 18 and Ibaya has 10, one of which is in, um, in supping. So, oh, oh, okay. It's with supping. Yeah, so 27, 27 in windsurfing and yeah. 28 with with stopping <laughs> so yeah no i'm not uh, dedicating my life to earning the most titles ever <laughs> not at all um I, I don't know i just i think after you won a couple of titles you realize that i don't know i'm not defined by those titles necessarily you know it's um it's not my life goal it's like every year is a new year and I just want to be a better windsurfer. Like, Sarakita today, like, I would kick my butt from 10 years ago, you know? Like, I am so much better than I was back then, yeah. even though that was worth the title back then as well. So I'm way more satisfied knowing that I'm a better windsurfer now than I was back then. Yeah. Um, so then the satisfaction in, in winning the title, like, it really comes when I feel that I've, I've done better. And I think especially that uh, last wave sailing world title, that seemed like I was, I was there kind of on the wave tour when you were starting and you were like really definitely more motivated than for, for anything else, right? To just start yeah. from zero, start from scratch, like a flat water, almost, almost a lake girl, right? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I had no clue how to turn a board. Like I was just spinning out the fins all the time. And I thought that was epic. And uh, then I heard from people that I, that I wasn't actually turning on the wave. <laughs> I should use the rail of the board and, you know. So I think that was just really fun. It's like a learning process. And um, being at the bottom again, it's like I keep mentioning it. It's just like I had something to work towards. And I feel like freestyling and wave sailing are two of the most fun disciplines for like free sailing because it's, it's such a, um, it's so creative, you know, on the water, like no wave is the same, no turn is the same. So I think every session is just, yeah. You, and yeah. I remember we were, I think, texting your first Aloha Classic and you said like, oh, I cannot believe 
this is real wave riding. I can't Dude. I was hitting the white water in Pozo. Now this is like, this is so amazing. Like you were so genuinely, genuinely like shocked almost. Hey man, I didn't grow up with waves. There's no waves in Aruba. Not I know, really. but didn't you watch videos? I mean, like. Sh sure I did, but I also saw many Pozo videos and that's where everyone does like this freestyle stuff on the, on the white water. So to me, that's wave sailing. And then, um. I think I went to Cape Town in 2014 for the first time, and that's when I like. I've been to Maui, but I didn't sail Hokipa that much. Like the first day I went out in Hokipa when I was like 14, yes, I've seen waves. So in my mind, it's like, oh, it looks great. So I went out, first wave comes up, and I just see like a wall of water for as far as I can see, you know. Good thing I knew how to freestyle. So my, I shake and jive, and like I raced back inside because that thing was huge. So that was like my first encounter with waves. But it wasn't until like Cape Town in 2014 that I really like got pounded a bit. And um, yeah, honestly, I was a bit scared at first, you know, because you get tumbled, you don't know where you are. But in the end, that's just experience. And um, after Cape Town and stuff, I went back to Pozo and that's when I realized, okay, so wave sailing is like, it's not just this in Pozo, but it's also like in Maui and yeah. that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, Maui, the Aloha Classic every year is um, very challenging. Yeah, especially coming from silt, from the cold, jet lag. Yeah. You don't have so much time to actually warm up, to prep, to set up your gear. And yeah, there's a lot of things. I, 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 really, I really watch this and I'm like, holy shit, the guys just flew in and like it's 10 knots and must high. And, it's the most massive swell every time. It's not like you don't ease into it there. Like every time we get there, we get like the biggest forecast every time. Don't worry. The first time I went, I got jaws on my second day. So. But you went out straight in jaws or what? Yeah, but I was shitting my pants like you don't believe. It was... <laughs> oh. Anyway, um, so where does slalom fit into all this? Um, like right now or? Yeah, like in general, because you describe all this, you know, being so motivated for wave sailing and freestyle being kind of what puts yeah. the, the bread on the table, let's say, or whatever. And, you know, like this work kind of freestyle would be work. Yeah. Waves would be this passion. No, I think slalom is a bit more work than freestyle. Um, I... Yeah, so slalom is also very accessible here, flat water. So it wasn't that hard to like train and improve in slalom. I think the most training and improving I did was at the competitions though. Um, I don't know, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't very consistent in the beginning. I still don't think my jibes are the greatest, but I, I have solid starts and my speed is good. And back in the day, I, um, there's a couple of guys that always help me out with tuning and stuff. Like Arnon has helped me so much and just taught me the basics of everything. And then when I'm home here, there's Ethan Westra, who's also insane. So I have some people around me that help me out. And um, I think in the end, like I figured it also out. And then every time, like slalom is a lot of preparation on land with the gear. Um, and I just feel like I, I am good in... I'm really good in certain conditions, for especially big gear, like 7.8 and big board, 7.8 medium board, 7.0. On the smaller gear, I'm not as solid because um, it doesn't get that windy here in Aruba. But yeah, I don't know. I just accumulated some experience along the way and I have good people around me to help me with the gear. So but if you I, like, because the last, few, last few years you've been in and out of the slalom tour, let's say. Yeah. Like a few yeah. years ago, you won, I think, four titles, like almost in a row. And yeah. now you're kind of in and out. Is it that because it's too much? Everything is too much? The waves, yeah. the freestyle, the, or is it just like you just don't want to be at the beach 300 days a year? 
Um, yeah, it was just, uh, it was taking a toll on me. It's, it was too much. It's, I am not at the beach 300 days a year. Like if I'm doing slalom freestyle wave, I'm traveling and dragging gear around most of the time just to get from one event to the next or go from one training spot to the other. So I felt like it was taking away from my time on the water. Like I wasn't able to improve in freestyle and wave as much as I wanted to. And um, yeah, I just felt like I really wanted to improve in freestyle and wave. I wasn't, I was at home like one month a year. So everything takes its toll. Like, and it, like I was low on energy. So then I realized I need to like stop something, which is for me, the most obvious was um, slalom. Cause I think that's also the discipline that I can get back into quicker. Cause way sailing for me is now, I think like just physically and with all the impacts you're making, I need to invest time in that now. And then because I already have the experience with slalom, I can, I can come back to that. Yeah, also um, but yeah, it's been about two years yeah. off to now. Excuse me. You also, you don't need to be so nimble and you don't need to be so, you know, you can start slow yeah. again at 35 or whatever. So. Yeah, I think so. So then, so I, I have done like one slalom contest at the year if it, if it made sense, if I was there anyway. And every time, like I love sailing slalom, but competing is like the ultimate adrenaline rush, more than waves, more than freestyle. So I... Yeah, I live for those contests, like like coming up to the starting line with starting line with eight other girls and and racing to the first mark. There's nothing like it. So it's not like I prefer freestyling and wave sailing that much more. It's just yeah, I, I love sailing salam also. Yeah, it like, just sucks that it takes all this preparation, right? Yeah, yeah, it takes a lot of time. But I'm I feel like so like I got the reward for it last year with winning the wave title by not doing slalom. So it was worth it. Um, but I think like slowly I might like move back into slalom. I think I'm, I'm itching. Foiling? I have been foiling a bit here at home. It's a bit of a pain in the butt sometimes because my foil jibes are still not so solid. And it's, <laughs> yeah, I don't like it when I'm not so good at something. So like, I feel like a total cook, honestly. Um, yeah, I just need to learn how to tune the foil a bit better, I guess. But um, it's fun. It's fun to cruise around. I just feel like maybe I need to do a contest to really get into it. So maybe next year, if there's a possibility for it, I might join a contest just to gain that experience also. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's get into what I think is might be the most interesting part or the most emotional, let's say. Is How compared to men? Yeah. How much? And don't you don't need to give me numbers, but you can give me like more or less a level. How much money does a seventeen-time world champion, ev like in every discipline, yeah, make compared? to men let's say like uh you know the numbers we all know the rumors we all know the you know what who is making what and yeah whatever i know more or less but give us like a little rundown and why do you think that is okay so very honestly i i don't know the numbers first of all like from all the guys um yeah so sometimes just if i think about it just the fact that i'm doing all three disciplines and i'm doing them all very well i i think a guy doing all three disciplines is would be unpayable these days you know and i think i am for doing all three i'm at the same level of like one guy doing slalom and i maybe and one guy doing slalom really well because I feel like slalom guys are the ones that earn the most compared to like freestyling and wave. Maybe there's some wave guys that do really well also. Because I feel like as three persons in one, I'm, I'm worth the same as one guy, I guess. I think, I don't know. Um, yeah. Why, why do you think that is? 
Uh, I mean, it's a, it's quite a big discrepancy, uh, but let's dive into this a little bit. The thing is, I cannot say much about it because I don't, I do not know the actual numbers. It's just like a feeling I get sometimes that like, I just feel like I put in the effort for like three people and it's like, um, yeah, it, it is a fact that as a woman, you are earning less than guys. And then, yeah, I am, I would say that I'm lucky that I'm, I'm doing all three and doing them good. So I do, I Let's mean, say I you do go live to a sponsor. Let's say you go to a sponsor, you have your, your yearly meeting. Um, what do you hear? Like, do you hear, we love you, but the business is tough? Or? Yeah, every year. But is, does that conversation circle around girls versus guys? Like? Oh, man. Um, I, I just think in general, like from back in the day compared to now, like things are so much tougher for all the businesses. So they do have to like, I, I know like from back then to now, it was easier to get gear and get budget the first two years I was on tour, it was like, it was like that. It's like, okay, great. So that was kind of my standard. And then now, um, doing negotiations is like, yeah, it's, um, you just feel that it's much harder for all the companies as well. So, yeah, I don't have so much comment on it, honestly. It's, uh, it's, it's hard for a lot of writers. Oh, because I think that that's where, where the whole, Mm, that's where like the soul the soul of that problem between girls you know of girls feeling undervalued is basically the money right because this is a representation of how you're valued within the sport yeah. right yeah and you're the best person to talk about it because you're a freaking world champion in three disciplines mm -hmm. and current in two, you know, and not so long. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's who better to give, to give that perspective, you know, because if you have a certain perspective, then for other girls, it's, it can only be tougher, you know? Yeah. So this, I don't want to whine, but I just want to hear I, your thoughts where this comes from because I have mine and we all have ours and we've all been to those meetings. Yeah. We've all, you know, been in those email threads that talk about these things and, and yeah, just wanted to know your thoughts a little bit. Yeah, I think... Um... I think a general saying that like over the years we've heard quite often is that like they say that guys sell more gear than women, first of all. So then, you know, then uh, promoting guys is going to bring the, the company more earnings, you know, that's what they say. Um, then there's another thing that they say, like, you know, the level of the women is not so high. So then, you know, it's not worth that much, but you know what we're doing now, the guys were also doing five years ago, let's say in freestyle and in ways, and they were earning this, their, that was earning double what we're earning now, you know, and we're doing what they were doing then. It's just like being compared to them all the time. Yes, our level is going to be lower. Um, but if you look back in time, we're doing what they were doing as well. And they're just not valuing it like that. I feel like they just shouldn't be comparing the women to the men all the time. That's what, that's my, that's where my main motivation comes from to like just raise the level. So we don't hear like, you know, the, the women's level is not that great. It is, it is really high. Um, and then after that, I had one more comment. Um, and then you, what happens very often to us is that we're being promoted on like, Sure, it, it's also a good thing. Like the good thing about windsurfing is that it, it is for everybody and you should promote it as an extreme sport, as a family sport, that men can do it, women can do it, kids can do it. 
But then you find very often that women are portrayed on beginner gear and free ride gear in a bikini and, you know, with a hand in the water, which is nice. But um, we also have shots, like pretty epic shots with freestyling and wave sailing and going fast on slalom gear. And to get more women into the market, how, how are you going to do that if you're only promoting men doing all of that, mostly promoting men doing all of that stuff? Like put a picture use Dida, use Ibaya, use me, um, Uda, Mike, uh, Ariana, like use them in, in their respective disciplines because we're the ones that are going to pull more women into the market, not the, not the guy that's doing it. So I feel like from the brands, maybe they can push a bit more. I think on you touched on something that's really important that probably yeah. as the current situation, 80% of windsurfers are men. So then the brands... Yeah. They obviously, their job is to sell. So then they want to sell to their majority customer. But then if they promote it to women, maybe there would be more women. So it's like a kind of a, a wheel that, you know, you cannot really. For sure, because women, yeah, women relate to women and men relate to men. So they're like that, that just shows that it's like, if it's 80% pretty sure, men. Pretty sure women relate to men as well. But, you know, this kind of, back in the day, back in the day, it was that. Like, you know, like you say, bikini, hand in the water and whatever. Yeah. First of all, this became sexist now. Yes. You know, we're living in this world where there is so much more awareness and kind of input on that. Mm, yeah. Not to portray women that way. And... And then, like, so what's the angle? What's the niche? You know, like, what's the... Because I think if you look at any successful women's sport, there is a little bit of a different angle. Because if you're selling a product, it cannot just be the same product, like you say, five years later, you know, the level of windsurfing. It needs to be slightly different, you know? So like tennis, they connected it, I guess, to, I don't know, fashion, right? Or mm-hmm. surfing, it got connected again to this bikini fashion, which now they're, you know, really aware not to push too much, but it's still kind of there. The girls are modeling and yeah. this and that. Mm-hmm. So, so what is it for windsurfing? You know, what is it? How can we try to get you girls more value? Because... You say you hate the free ride stuff. I actually like the idea of I actually like the idea of um, putting girls on these three cam sales that these days are absolutely amazing. They're as yeah. fast. They just have a little bit less top end range, which um, which you know you don't really use that much because you don't need to go super overpowered or whatever as we do they're easier to jive and whatever and then you get the brand kind of um, like an opportunity to promote a different product through the pwa tour you know but girls hated it and the brands actually hated it too that idea so i it fell through and i'm i'm wondering did you do you girls um have these kind of ideas you know because i'm trying i was trying to think today and yesterday i was i was prepping for this interview and Mm -hmm. it's hard yeah yeah it is hard um so so all this bikini stuff you know to me it's fine if you're also promoting the sport itself you know like everyone promotes themselves in a different way and it's totally fine um, and it is part of windsurfing. We are at the beach. We are like um, in, in not so much clothing. And so I think that's totally fine. But um, the, I don't hate the free riding. I just feel like you can use that, but also use the other stuff, which shows like the higher level of the women. I love free riding. Um, the three camp thing. I think that was a thing. I think I even was confronted with it, confronted with it at some point. Um, I just realized, like, if I'm sailing a three cam against someone that has a four cam sail, 
that person is likely going to be faster, even though you're overpowered. So I am, I think there were some tests that were really fast, but like the ultimate speed is when you go with a four cam sale. So like for PWA contests and stuff, I would stick with that sale. But if you're promoting that three cam sale to a free rider, like a free rider that wants to go fast in their free sessions, I will probably use that sale in my free session. But if it's a contest, yes, I will use the most high end sale. Um, but it's just, a, it's just a hard question. I just think that, um, like we push ourselves a lot as girls cause that's, we're able to promote ourselves a lot, but then I feel like it's also part of the brand's job to maybe push us a little bit more, I think. Um, because again, if you're saying that's only 80%, like 80% is men, then it means that there's so many, so many more women that could, could get into the sport. Um, and yes, you say women relate to men as well, but I know for a fact that there is so many women that they're, they're very intimidated to even get into windsurfing. Like, again, like if, if there's a guy there, like with all these muscles holding onto this, no offense. There's a lot of guys that don't have the perfect technique because they're so strong, you know? So for a woman to see another woman holding on to a sail, that will make it more, look more accessible, I think. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's also not, you know, you have all this gear, you need to carry it. You have to downhold the sail. I mean, you yeah. probably have that, that power because you've done it for so many years, but you know, yeah. actually not the slalom sail. I remember you with a little. <laughs> Better at it now. Yeah. But so back in the day, I, I needed other guys to pull it for me. But um, I think I think windsurfing is such a fun sport, and it and it's an insane lifestyle. And the the moment that literally everyone gets hooked to windsurfing is when you start planing. You know that feeling of blasting across to the across the water, and you know anyone can get to that point at this moment with the with the quality of gear we have now. Like it's so easy. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Maybe that's the angle. You know, like more lifestyle and traveling yeah. and, and these kind of things. I see like Lena doing a lot of the vlogs and, and stuff. Um, yeah. And she created, yeah. yeah, she created this blog where like this forum where more women can find each other and stuff. So I think that's a, a big thing. Again, if there's a lot of men in the sport and women don't see like those other women there, they might not join. But then when they realize there's more people out there that also want to join them, Maybe more women will come into the sport. But at the um, same time, what do you think when you see, mm, you know, maybe girls not necessarily, like in slalom, the participation is great, right? Yeah. And freestyle is just, windsurfing already is small and specific. And yeah. Style is even more specific, you know, and then you have you that you're throwing like i don't know scopus and kabikuchis and stuff mm -hmm. and then you know the drop off in level is is just huge you know so it's i don't know it's it's just so hard to you know if you're if like if you're an organizer it's it's so it's just so hard i don't know i i don't know what to say here like it's i want to touch on this subject and i want to get into it but i just have no answers i almost have no questions you know what i mean yeah, i mean in the end it's a vicious circle you know like if we're and it's this is a story that has been going on for years um but i am for my story for example like i got really good support from the start i am lucky that i am from aruba so i had i had so much time on the water you know so i've been able to like develop my skills and, and improve um all the way up to till i was like 18 years old and then once i was in holland i didn't windsurf as much but then compare someone that lives in europe doesn't get all the support so like maybe has one or two sales and one board for a year which gets damaged um, do, doesn't get as much time on the water um, and then financially also needs to support herself and is probably studying because you know she's not getting the support from the industry 
you just don't have as many hours on the water compared to guys who have been supported financially a bit more, who maybe have chosen not to, not to study and stuff, but they were they're spending time on the water. So the difference for sure mostly is that most guys, they have been, they've had more hours on the water and they've had the support to, to be able to do that. And I think, so the less hours you spend on the water, um, less chances you have to get better as well. So it, it just like kind I of kind keeps of, on going. Yeah, I understand that. But I kind of, I had this argument with, with some girls before. Like, yeah. you know, we, like, you know how many guys raise some borrowed money to try to make it or how many guys quit school, university or whatever yeah. and just go all in. And if they make it, they make it. If not, you know, so. Yeah, so I'm not talking about, um, I do think that a lot, so in general, windsurfing is a smaller sport and most people are having a hard time to do it. But the likeliness of a guy getting better support than a girl, it's, it's there and it's true. So if you're, yeah. 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 You know, like I know guys are also struggling and they have put everything in it. But that's, again, the same thing. Compare that guy to the top-level guy who is getting everything. The top-level guy is the one that progresses more because he has more, yeah. you know? Yeah. So... It's actually easier to stay in that, in that circle. Do you feel like moves like equal prize money in Pozo, does that move the needle a little bit? Do you see girls going like, okay, I can actually you know, make a few thousand euros there and, you know. And hey, I know this it was a huge difference, man. Like, I, you know, I do the event because I love the event. I, I want to get better. But then you check your bank accounts like, whoa. And it's somehow that kind of like releases a bit of stress because it's, it's like you can plan other things because you're earning a bit more. So I think it, it is very motivating that, that they put equal prize money there. Um, for sure, if they start doing this at other events as well, it's is definitely a big push for many women, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is so hard. I mean, I, I wanted, I put it on my on my list of things to ask you and I was like, how am I going to steer this conversation? It's like, it's impossible. I mean, we all, you know, we all would like to see girls with more support, but we also know, understand why there isn't this support. And at the same time, there is no obvious, obvious. Um, I mean, in way. the end, everything everything comes back to the fact that just that windsurfing wasn't as that it isn't as big of a sport as it was back in the day, you know, just back in the day, everything was so much easier. Mm. Um, yeah. Gear is quite expensive. Not everyone can afford it. So maybe companies are selling less and then, you know, kind of keeps on going like that. I guess for the tour, it just, yeah, we've been talking about it for a while. Like we just need to find another way to add value to those events for organizers and stuff. So, um yeah there's like several angles to look at it i guess and no one has the answers right now yeah okay to move on from this heavy, <laughs> heavy <Let's go. laughs> yeah let me read you one thing yeah and this is gonna be the beginning of the end of this conversation mm -hmm. so the first thing I do always is I look at a PWA profile of a person. Mm -hmm. And on your profile, it's, there's a little bio, bio and, you know, something that, I don't know, a 13, 14 year old Sarakita must have written. Yeah, I think it was 12. What are your ambitions? Represent Aruba make people more enthusiastic about windsurfing in Aruba. I would really want to surf in Barbados and Margarita. Signed, Sarakita Rastagal. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, 
you've kind of fulfilled your ambition and then some. <laughs> I accept that I haven't windsurfed in Barbados yet. Oh, yeah. no way. I'm going to make that happen though. Um, yeah, fulfill, let check for, what was it? Making the first people one? more enthusiastic and represent Aruba. Represent, yeah. Surf yeah. margarita. But do you do you catch yourself looking back sometimes? Like a thing uh, like this COVID thing that you know we don't know what's gonna happen. Like, mm -hmm. do, do you yeah. do, do you look back sometimes at, at your career, at the things you've done, and you know? Yeah, I. The thing is, I've been doing it for a long time now. Like I've been on tour since. 2005 let's say so it's like 15 years mm, i catch myself looking back now a bit more and like i understand that i probably have more years behind me than ahead of me on tour so that's all that's actually quite hard as well but i just know that i i've had the greatest time being on tour and I think at the beginning, I didn't necessarily set these goals and have these ambitions. Like I just wanted to windsurf and I thought it was awesome to windsurf with the best in the world. And I started doing that at 12, 13 years old, you know, so that was almost like my standard. Um, um, that's what I was used to, to sail with the best. Yeah. So I, yeah, yeah, just well, looking back at it now, just, I'm just grateful I had all those opportunities and still have. What's next? Yeah. With Sarah Kita. Um, so as much as I love being home and being with my family, it's been five months. Um, <laughs> I feel like I need to start traveling again. And um, yeah, just made me realize how much, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not here for, so I love the tour, competing is fun, but yeah, I don't live necessarily for all the contests it's just like the whole lifestyle of it of like traveling around meeting people making memories and stuff like i can't wait to go out on an adventure again so yeah for this year doesn't look like we're gonna have many contests maybe one in france which i'm looking forward to if we do slalom but um yeah just the just the feeling of traveling again i can't wait I'm not sure that answered your question because I, I don't know where, like... How, 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 long, how long would you see yourself competing? Um, I don't know if it's a good thing to say. No, I'm kidding. I, yeah, so you see people on tour, like at 40, you're still on tour. It's possible in this sport. I have been doing it for a long time, so I'm not sure I'm going to do it till I'm 40. But I, the past four or five years, I felt like I, I've been enjoying it more and more every year. So I, I don't, I haven't set a final time for competing. It's like as long as I'm enjoying it, as long as it's going well, I think I'm gonna be doing it. Cause it's like the best job in the world. I asked, I remember asking Steve Allen, like he had, he has been on tour for a long time, and he was still there. And it's like Steve, why do you still do this? And he literally said, like, this is the best job in the world. And I agree more and more with him every year. Yeah, definitely. And what's on the, is there a bucket list, like, of things you want to do or you wanted to do and you never really had the time because of competing, you know, windsurf oriented, I don't know. Yeah, sounds a bit silly, but I think um, I would definitely go to more like concerts, concerts and festivals in summertime in Europe. Maybe yeah, do, like I think more like I don't know, like Jaws or Luderitz or whatever. Uh, but... <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It sounds silly. Like I want to go to a festival. <laughs> I don't want to do Jaws. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, um, I know, I know what you mean because that's exactly what I was asking you about this adolescence period that you lose, you know, because all our friends yeah. did it, and I went that's to the first I do. <laughs> at, at 22 years old or something, you know. Um, uh, like 
maybe sound silly again. I want to land a double forward. I want to do push forwards. I want to get better at big waves, but jaws is not necessarily appealing to me. Um, like I rather, I want to be good at a wave like um, Punta Preta, you know, Cabo Verde. Pretty big, but like it's shreddable, you know. Yeah. Um, jaws would be more of a bumpy ride down the face, and I'm not sure how much. I'm just scared. I don't want to go down that wave. It's big, so I don't know. That was double I, yeah. forwards and push forwards. That's huge. I mean, I have the push loop down. Like, why can't I do the push forward yet? I'm going to do it soon. Um, other than that, I yeah, I just want to travel to certain places. Like, Guadeloupe is a place I really want to see for windsurfing. Um, there's this trip that Jules Denel did in uh, Tunisia, I think. Look epic. But yeah, I just want to experience different spots. Traveling. Yeah, this yeah is what, I, think so. I think this is what people don't understand that we go on tour and we keep going kind of to the same places you know and yeah you almost years. don't feel like traveling anymore because you you go to that same cafe in yeah in japan or in korea or whatever you know which is nice because it's also familiar but like going on tour the first couple of years was a, a total adventure because those were all new spots like every year when we have a new event like that is a highlight. Portugal two years ago was really, really cool. France at some point, La Torche and Crozon for me was really nice. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I was actually like enjoying Korea. <laughs> I love Korea. It's great. The first couple of years, it's like all new and you know, why are all, all these old guys complaining? You know? Yeah. And then you like, you catch yourself I was really thinking to myself, you know, like the old guys complaining about certain things, whether it be money or not the greatest places on tour or whatever. And, you know, and mm -hmm. then 10 years passed and you kind of, you're that old guy. <laughs> I'm right so, here now. Yeah. Pretty funny. Yeah. Okay. Before I let you go, I need to ask you some quick, quick fire. Yeah. What are your pet peeves? Pet peeves. Um, a person leaving their telephone like on loud and we having to hear that person receiving all their messages and replying to it. Put it on silent. We don't need to know. Basically what happened with my messenger just, just before, just a few minutes. That was just one time. It's okay. But like 10 times in 20 seconds. Come on. Yeah. This is one that I actually asked all the, but I had only men so far. And I wonder mm -hmm. if this applies to women as well. How many times a day do you pee your wetsuit? You want to hear? <laughs> I'm not shy about it, man. It's the best feeling in the world. <laughs> like, man, I'm from the Caribbean. Like, I don't like feeling cold. And I just feel like, I don't know, it's just warm for a second. So. All the time. Best. I yeah. rinse, it, rinse it afterwards. In silt, in silt, you're like you wish you could do it like every thirty seconds. Oh, I have no problem with that. I. <laughs> so then you run out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so aside. Yeah, I'm sorry. Too much information, maybe, but um, yeah. <laughs> aside from being the wetsuit, what is your guilty pleasure? Um. I guess chocolate is a bit boring. Watching the Kardashians sometimes. I don't watch it that much, but when I watch it, I watch it. <laughs> <laughs> what is your top five windsurfers of all time? Man, I have such a long list. Like I look up to so many sailors and then there's different disciplines. How am I gonna name five? You have five. That's all you're gonna get. You can't have all the chocolates today, Sarah. I want them all. Um, I think, yeah, Goyito is one of the most ridiculous competitors ever. Invented so many freestyle moves. Um, 
Antoine Albor, euh, Boujma, Zatri. Aïe. Um, one, two, three. That's way freestyle. I'm gonna hey, I'm gonna throw belts in there also. He's amazing. And uh, oh man! One second, one second. I'm almost there. Mm. No. <laughs> it's so hard. I want to I want to name everybody. Yeah, mm, also. Uh, I don't know, maybe uh, Kevin Pritchard? Like really good at everything. There yeah. You. I mean, but I need a guys and a girls list. Yeah. Cause then it's like, you know, then it's like gonna be like, Karen Yagi, Daida Ibaya, Steffi. Okay, so top five women. Yeah, because um, like I am, I'm not so good at like way before my time, but then in my time, yeah, it was Karen, Daida Ibaya, Steffi. I think also is a really good windsurfer. Um, yeah. Who else? There was four, one more. Four. Oh, it's okay. You know, Colette, Colette Guadagnino. I always looked up to her a lot. Most underrated winter for of all time. Mm. Like, I, again, I almost want to say Baltz. Like, you know, because he kind of has his reputation of being a bit crazy and stuff, but the fact that he can do all of that stuff is because he's so good at windsurfing, you know? Yeah. I feel like he's, yeah, he's a bit underrated, I think. Because you see him foiling and stuff, but see him like freestyling normally on a sunset session in Fuerte Ventura, it blows your mind. Yeah. About. So I guess the next one goes without saying. Foil freestyle, yes or no? Yes. I like watching it. I am not so into doing it myself. Why not? Um, I do so many disciplines already. <laughs> yeah. Um, nothing. I don't feel so much for it at the moment to do it myself. Yeah. And I, I'm not a good foiler. Maybe that's why. Obstacles and slalom, yes or no? Like jumping over obstacles? Not with slalom gear, no thank you. Like if it was super X and a bit, yeah, and a board easier to control, then yes, please, because that would be so much fun. But it's so fun to not... jump on slalom gear. It's the best, like just straight jumps. Yeah, I don't enjoy it. Not on slalom gear at all. Okay. Beach starts in slalom. Yes, yes let's do it. But like... Yeah, we'd have to be like holding the gear, like not running towards the gear because I'm really slow on land. But if we can like hold the gear and then run to the water and get on the water, that would be so much fun. Yeah. One spot you'd have to sail for the rest of your life every day. I mean, you're locked in a place. You have to choose yeah. a place. Yeah, as much as I like Aruba and stuff, like it is very flat. So one of the places that I think is, is really good is Coronation in Australia. It's flat, there's small waves in front and then bigger waves behind. It's a, such a diverse spot. Yeah. Who has the worst music on tour? Who has the worst music? Yeah. I think when Amado and Jordi get together, they have this like <laughs> house techno music on, it's horrendous. Yeah, I don't get that as well. Nobody likes it. For somebody that's yeah. never been to a PWA event, Sarah doesn't go like two meters without her speaker. <laughs> and it's just like reggaeton yeah. and hip hop. Yeah, all the time. But not at the techno stuff that they play. It's the worst. I agree. <laughs> Who's your worst competitor? 
my worst competitor. Um, how worse, like hardest person? Yeah, like. Yeah, I, I mean, I get. I've I've had the most. The hardest contest, I guess, were with the twins, I guess. And not that is, yeah, they're, they're really good competitors, really tough competitors. And I think those were like the mentally, mentally toughest contests in the beginning in freestyle and later in wave sailing. Like they're like, it's a wall you need to like go through, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so good, there. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then last but not least, who would you want to hear on this podcast? If you even listen sometimes to... yeah, yeah i've checked it out it's been very interesting all the guys that were on there it's like nice they have different perspectives i agree that junk art junk art definitely needs to get on here it's gonna but be i guess it. you got yeah 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 anybody um, else yeah i think um yeah uda uda is great she has like this whole other professional life and then came into this professional life. So it's like maybe cool to hear different perspectives. And then you can ask that men, women uh, question again. I don't wanna, I, I feel so bad asking it and. It's different, oh, different perspectives. Me, you know, they always give me, give me crap that I know everything, but this yeah. one I don't know. I, I really don't know. Yeah, well, so then you can find out slowly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for your time. Sorry for, because of the time difference, you had to kind of, I guess it's sailing time now. And we did it in the middle of your, of your sailing time. But It's okay. It's windy all day. I got an hour in. I can still go to the beach now. It's fine. No worries. Come down to Aruba. We'll go sailing every day. But you're not gonna be there. You said you're leaving. <laughs> I am. I mean, next season. Next season. I mean. Okay. Yeah. I hate flat water. So. No, there's waves here also. Like it's gonna surprise oh, you. This oh, time. Ethan. Ethan always tells me, man, there's no waves in Aruba. No waves in Aruba. And then I see you sailing waves all the time. So he's just too lazy to move to the other side of the island. I guess. I scored it. I scored it this season. It was oh, great. I saw you. It's sick little yeah. turn into tail throw into hit whatever yeah thing yeah it was really epic i also didn't expect it so that was it was like double the fun when we found those waves it was great i'm gonna stop posting my wave sailing videos because you you just <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right thank you sarah thanks so much thanks much Eric. Appreciate it. See you. Bye bye. Ciao. Thanks a lot for watching. Uh, as usual, I hope you're enjoying these podcasts. Uh, they're a bit of a beast. So if you want to chip in some beers and you're liking the podcast and you want to keep them flowing, I'm sure Matt Check, uh, me and the crew would be, uh, well, be very much appreciated. You can sign up below. Uh, I'll put the link. If you want to see other podcasts that we've done, there's been some super interesting ones. The Craig from Fanatic, I think, stood out for me. And uh, even the first one from Angulo. And don't forget Thomas Traversa. There's been so many cool podcasts, uh, obviously available on Spotify and iTunes. Get involved, like and subscribe so you don't miss another video.